When Granville Bantock died on the 16th of October, 1946, at the age of 78, there were memorial concerts and tributes from many of the great musical figures of the time. But for all his work, all his composing, all his adjudicating, all his teaching, and for all his promotion of festivals, he died virtually unknown, a man all but forgotten. The rise and fall of the music of Granville Bantock has to be one of the most baffling and doleful stories in the recent history of our country's music. During the first decades of the last century, Bantock, or GB as he was known, was duly acknowledged as one of the foremost composers of his generation, an important, much respected figure in the resurgence of British music. Today his scores remain unappreciated and ignored. They are only very rarely performed and command no place in the standard repertoire of his country. Yet, I believe he wrote some of the finest compositions ever to emerge from these aisles. Indeed, I would go as far as to say that GB has the unenviable distinction, with less than a handful of arguable contenders, of being the most unreasonably overlooked composer in the whole history of 20th century British music. Bantock's name is today usually associated with just two works, Pyrrho of the Minute and Fifin at the Fair. In fact, GB was a prolific composer and left behind an enormous and varied corpus. His music was often written on a grand scale, usually colourfully programmatic, intense and romantic, and almost without fail, with an assured masterly understanding of orchestral effect. Vaughan Williams once remarked, that what Bantock did not know about the orchestra is not worth knowing. In a biographical article, Vaughan Williams noted his regret in not having become his pupil, as Elgar had recommended. Elgar himself, whom GB once rivaled as the nation's premier musical figure, described him as having the most fertile imaginative brain of our time, and once gave the opinion, comparing GB with himself, Bantock is the more original, the deeper thinker, the more broadly sympathetic. At their very best, GB's compositions easily stand alongside the finest accomplishments of the more lauded figures of his era. It is about time his reputation as a composer was reassessed and restored at the forefront of the country's musical heritage. When Granville Bantock left the Royal Academy of Music in the summer of 1892, the musical die of his life had been cast there was no turning back now. Just one major problem, how to make a living. Over the next few years, GB composed three comedy operas of his own under the name Graban. He even had a music hall hit and enhanced his income with a song called Who'll Give a Penny for the Monkey? in which Nancy, his Australian monkey, was mentioned. Since leaving the Royal Academy of Music, his serious music had rarely been performed. So he decided to organise a concert of his own. It featured three of his compositions and works by some of his fellow students from the Academy. Although the Queen's Hall was only half full, the concert gained extensive coverage in the press, with GB acclaimed the musical leader of Young England. GB's appointment at New Brighton marked a new beginning in his personal life, but also on a professional level. When he began work, its now long since forgotten tower was still being finished. It was taller than Blackpool's and was an impressive statement on its ongoing commercial stature. It rose up from a large circular ballroom, which was the centrepiece of an extensive entertainment complex. For most aspiring composers, the role of conductor of a brass band and having to provide a popular diet of light, dance and military pieces in an out-of-the-way resort like New Brighton would have furnished little opportunity to make any mark on the musical world. In the hands of an energetic character like G.B., even such a backwater provided him with a springboard to realise his ambitious musical visions. He introduced not only standard works of the classical and early romantic repertoire, but also whole programmes devoted to modern continental composers, Wagner, 
Tchaikovsky, and Anton Rubinstein's long-forgotten Ocean Symphony were conspicuous regulars. While at New Brighton, G.B. was writing some of his best music thus far. Yet strangely, he only ever included four of his own compositions at New Brighton, and they were each in a light vein. It was not until February 1900, in Antwerp, on a return visit for a Belgian conductor who had been featured at the Tower, that G.B. felt able to conduct the premieres of his Helena Variations and his sweet Russian scenes in the style of Tchaikovsky. At a second concert the following year, one of his most impressive early works, Thalaba the Destroyer, was performed. The completed sets of the Songs of the East and elegiac poem for cello and orchestra were other notable works from this time, alongside more sprawling conceptions such as Christus. By the time G.B. resigned his position in 1900, he had transformed his local ensemble into an orchestra of national renown, and New Brighton had acquired a reputation as a centre of musical innovation. G.B. himself had arrived as an important pioneering figure in the musical life of the nation. During the 1899 New Brighton Tower season, conflicting opinions over G.B.'s musical plans came to a head. His musical ambitions had outgrown what was really possible at a provincial resort like New Brighton. Disenchanted with the sceptical attitude of the new management committee, he decided to consider more fulfilling prospects. He was offered a job at the Royal Academy of Music, but instead accepted the post of Principal of the Birmingham and Midland Institute School of Music situated in the heart of the city. G.B. immediately made a dramatic impact and clearly ruffled a few feathers. But the authors of the Institute's annual report for 1900 were impressed. They wrote, He has entered upon his work with enthusiasm and is transforming the school from a number of unconnected classes into an organised school. In 1902, Elgar became honorary visitor of the school and Rutland Boughton, Adrian Bolt, Julius Harrison and Joseph Holbrook, Ernest Newman and Clarence Raybould were all at various times on the staff. In addition to all his works on behalf of the Institute, he also became conductor of the Birmingham Amateur Orchestral Society and taking over from Elgar the Worcester Philharmonic Society and the Wolverhampton Festival Choral Society. From 1905 to 1908, Edward Elgar held the patent professorship of music here. Elgar wasn't really cut out for academic work, and so he recommended that Granville Bantock take that post. He was already, that is, Granville Bantock, principal of the Midland Institute School of Music. So for the first time in history, these two posts were combined in one person. That enabled him to weld the teaching of music in Birmingham into one coherent scheme of teaching. There was a huge emphasis on English medieval works, some modern composers, and now and again, simply to satisfy his own mercurial temperament. He would indulge in something quite different, like a course in campanology. He even got Cadbury's, the chocolate manufacturers, to purchase a clarion of bells. It was during this time that he founded the Birmingham Philharmonic Society, which led in time to the creation of Birmingham's first Philharmonic Orchestra in 1917. These were the years of his contribution to the festivals movement. This led to some most creative collaborations with other composers like Frederick Delius, who was living in France, Hugh Robertson of the Orpheus Choir in Glasgow, Walford Davis, and 
Henry Wood of Promenade Concert fame. Granville Bantock was an inspired, enthusiastic teacher. In spite of his controversial, somewhat idiosyncratic methods, some of his students ultimately achieved considerable fame. Julius Harrison, Frank Mullings, Dorothy Silk are just three of them. He organized these students into the performance of really very ambitious concerts, one a year in Birmingham Town Hall. At the same time, Granville Bantock's colossal drive and charisma brought to Birmingham some really interesting and exciting characters. Sibelius came two or three times and stayed with the Bantocks in their homes. Sibelius dedicated his third symphony to Granville Bantock. Edward Elgar continued to be a close family friend and he was the honorary visitor to the University of Birmingham. There were others too, like Havagal Bryan and Joseph Holbrook, whose music he sponsored. And on one occasion, I think it was in 1914, Prokofiev came and he played chess with Prokofiev. I don't know who won. And we must remember that it was during these years he was composing most prolifically. These are the years of some of his greatest musical works. The list is impressive. Fifin at the Fair, Omar Khayyam, which is probably his greatest work, Piero the Minute, Sea Wanderers, The Witch of Atlas, The Hebridean Symphony, and we mustn't forget these large-scale choral symphonies, Atalanta in Caledon, Vanity of Vanities, Song of Songs. The list is almost endless. The climax of these wonderful years is surely the first performance of the Hebridean Symphony in 1915. Ernest Newman has written, at its best, the Hebridean Symphony is the most beautiful sea music ever written. It marks the climax of the Edwardian age and the career of Granville Bantock. Anton, I've long been fascinated by Granville Bantock, both the man and the composer, but you, of course, knew him. How would you describe the character of someone as paradoxical as Granville Bantock? He was a maverick, a renegade, full of contradictions. He was a man who'd read deeply into all the sacred scriptures, including Christianity. Some of his great works were inspired by what he had learned. It certainly contributed to his philosophy of life. The unfinished work Christus and Vanity of Vanities were based on the Bible. But at the same time he reveled in his paganism. And he was almost profane in demonstrating that. Now, I know these titles come from literature, but when you look at some of the titles of his earlier works, especially like Witch of Atlas and Satan in Hell and the great god Pan, he does go really rather over the top. And I recall especially the occasion when that symphonic overture, Saul, was first performed in Chester Cathedral. He insisted that there was voluptuous dancing to go with it. And the clergy were scandalised, but he got away with it. His fixations could be intellectual artistic, but sometimes amounted to nothing much more than peculiarities of dress code. The story I like is about the the, the red corduroys. He flouted convention. I believe he was the first professor of music who, who appeared at official functions in a corduroy suit, which was a shade of puce or bright mauve. And then these extravagant gestures. I've been brought up on a story of Granville Bantock engaging a brass band to play Prussian military music outside his house in King Norton 
on Christmas Day in the morning. I think the world is richer for crazy people like that. When we look, for example, at his mentality, his demeanour, people on meeting him would say, oh, he's simple, self-effacing, a humble person. And in fact, when he was given the knighthood, he didn't even tell his family. They had to read about it in the newspaper, including his wife and children. And yet, sit against that, you have all this showing off, this dressing up in strange costumes. He loved being photographed. He was certainly very liberal, open-hearted, very generous, endlessly encouraging the works of other struggling composers. When he came to putting together programmes, he would even put the works of his fellows before that of his own. When my father and my uncles, after Granville Bantock's death, started sorting through his letters, they found an absolute treasure trove. It's now in the Worcester Record Office. 600 from Joseph Holbrook. Letters from Sibelius, Delius, Rachmaninoff, Prokofiev, as well as from Sir Thomas Beecham and other musical personalities who received knighthoods during GB's lifetime. Elgar, Stanford, Henry Wood, Bax, Hamilton Harty and Donald Tovey. Another collection of letters were from Bernard Shaw, Edith Sitwell, Arnold Bennett, Gordon Bottomley, Professor Einstein, Edward Carpenter, Sir Oliver Lodge, George Russell, Edmund Dulac. Others were from Holst, Vaughan Williams, John Ireland, Balfour Gardner, Rosa Newmarch, Cyril Scott, Dame Ethel Smythe and Rutland Boughton. I'd like to say a little bit about Sappho. Like Omar Khayyam, it's based on poems that are fragmentary. In this case, Helena, Bantog's wife, helped him assemble the fragments into an order and again a kind of dramatization, in this case of Sappho's own experience, that he felt he could use musically. I do marvel at the fluency of imagination that he had as a composer. It is eclectic. You can hear, yes, this bit's very Tchaikovsky and this bit is Wagnerian, this bit is a bit more modern and sounds like Rimsky-Korsakov. And yet, at the same time, it does add up. It's a lovely piece to play and sing and hear. Uh, and we see where Bantock's further sym sympathies lie. <laughs> like the god Wotan damning the whole earth to something there. It's a trick he's learned from Wagner. So he was a true eclectic. It all comes together in Sappho, but I think it hangs together. He knew how to make something hang together. The work which is probably felt by most to sum up Bantock's musical achievement is the very large-scale piece for three soloists, chorus and orchestra, Omar Khayyam. Now this is a complete setting of all 101 quatrains of Edward Fitzgerald's translation of the ancient Persian poems, the Rubaiyat. Little four-line verses with a rhyme at the end of the first, second and fourth line. 101 of them, not really telling a story, but in a kind of poetic order that gives an overall shape to the experience. That's what Fitzgerald did when he published this set of poems immensely popular in the 19th century, published I think first in 1869. I think we learn a lot about Bantock, the man and the musician, from his determination to set the entire thing to music. So I think Bantock knew what he was doing, but it was a phenomenal task. The chorus would be two to three hundred singers, and he divides that up into two choruses, I imagine he expected them to be uh, one side of the stage and the other. 
they divide into four parts, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. They subdivide. So at times, if you've got the two choruses, you've got 16 different things going on in the voice parts alone. Another indication of how I think he knew what he was doing in planning a piece of this enormous magnitude on the large scale, he starts the piece with a rather unusual cadence that tells us that we're, we're not in the normal Western world. We're somewhere else in time or place. Technically, it's called a Phrygian cadence. And it blasts out on the orchestra after the very first notes, which incidentally uh, are an Islamic call to prayer. After that, we get this cadence. Which, by implication, is related to the more Western world of C major, which would be that, taking us back to that tune. And I think he wants us to keep those two worlds of the familiar, the cosy, the comfortable, the fulfilled, and the mysterious, the unknowing, the unknowable, in his case the East as he sees it, represented by that rather strange cadence. And the two come back right at the end. Three hours later, he hasn't forgotten that those are the two things that he wants us to take away with us. The vast majority of Granville Bantock's scores are here in the Special Collections Library at the University of Birmingham. Here are the original manuscripts of Fiffin at the Fair, Piero of the Minute, the Hebridean and Pagan Symphonies, The Witch of Atlas, The Sea Wanderers, Omar Khayyam, and the Celtic opera The Seal Woman. In February 1907, Kennedy Fraser gave her first recital of the Hebridean songs that she had acquired. They were such a success with the in crowd in London that she decided to resume her collecting in earnest. Marjorie Kennedy Fraser made a further visit to the Outer Hebrides and eventually published three volumes of Songs of the Hebrides. These Songs of the Hebrides had a monumental influence on his later music. G.B.'s original sketches show that the Hebridean Symphony was initially entitled Among the Western Isles, Hebridean Tone Poem. In typical Bantockian style, all is encompassed in one movement. But its supreme magnitude, the sublime scale of its creative imagination, its dense textures and complex polyphony, and the sheer thrilling grandeur of its orchestral impact undoubtedly make it a work of symphonic proportion. At the age of 61, in 1930, Granville Bantock was knighted for his services to British music. He became Sir Granville Bantock. The irony of it was that about this time, he and his music passed into almost total obscurity. He was no longer modern, and of course his fondness for grandiose pieces and exotic subject matter became distinctly outmoded. One fundamental point, I think, is that unlike Elgar, GB was never able to acquire any great hit, no pomp and circumstance marks, something that might have enabled GB to retain some musical common denominator with the public and help him override the lean years until cultural assessments had realigned to more considered centres of gravity. It is also important to remember that unlike his more moneyed, privileged peers such as Vaughan Williams and Delius, GB depended on music for his living. GB was a working musician. By the very nature of his circumstance, he was forced into a great deal of commissioned work. GB was just too prolific, wrote far too much music of merely usable quality, and in the end this came to obscure his many works of genuine achievement. He was unable to curb his delusions to grandeur, which made him proceed with too many overinflated, self-indulgent musical projects. His weakness for extravagance, which did so much to impugn his reputation, concealed the true worth of his music. 
Then again, such tendencies were also an essential part of his very virtue. After all, they led to the Hebridean Symphony. If there is just one work for which Bantock's genius should be remembered, then surely this is it. He had a great feeling of the poetry of music and the, the poetry of life. His uh, music is therefore mainly program music. His harmony was not essentially original. He used the Liszt Straussian harmonic structure. Wagner too used it. But other composers contemporary to my father, such as Vaughan Williams and uh, Holst, tried to escape from this influence and to some extent succeeded. My father had no intention of escaping. He used this harmonic structure and developed it. And for this reason, his music is considered less original than these other composers. And this may be one of the reasons why he has not been so popular. Nevertheless, I consider he was a very great composer because of his sense of beauty and of also his marvelous power of orchestration. Once a, a composer's music returns, it stays, I think, and just as any other work of art. Once it's come back, it'll stay. No doubt about it. <laughs>